Usually, the number one reason for travelers visiting Africa is to embark on a wildlife safari or climb Kilimanjaro. While the continent certainly has some of the most extensive wildlife viewing opportunities, there's a whole other side to this place that you'll be astounded to know exists. 20 Shocking Things Recently Discovered in Africa The Fall of Carthage in the ancient Phoenician city off the northern coast of Africa was a place called Carthage. Its name literally translates to new city or new town and was the most powerful land in the region before the rise of ancient Rome. A lot of that power came from the multiple trade routes leading in and out of the city, as well as an impressive Mediterranean harbor. Sometimes good seafood is just too hard to pass up. But the height of the city's power was mostly due to the established Phoenician trade network importers and exporters alike built a massive framework that made Carthage the richest city in all of the Mediterranean. The trade was so good that they had to keep building docks for more people to visit, until there were well over 200 that were all in constant use. But as successful as the townspeople were, and despite the legacy they all lived through, the mini metropolis was challenged when it came to the Punic Wars. The struggle between the rising Romans and the people of Carthage lasted between 264 and 146 BC and took place over sea and land. If you know a thing or two about Roman history, you probably figured out that Carthage did not fare well during these wars. The city suffered some damage in the two first major battles and eventually lost control of Sicily when the first war came to a close. After their defeat in the Second War, they had to give up even more territory. By the Third War, Rome was ready to take over everything. The wars lasted for almost a full century, but despite their ultimate downfall, the ruins still make a nice tourist attraction. Fasten your seatbelts, because it's time for today's sweet topic. What a man discovered in Africa shocked the whole world. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's a Kalugo. If you see one of these creatures gliding between the trees, you might think you're witnessing something prehistoric, and you wouldn't be wrong. Kalugos are mammals from an ancient lineage, diverging from other mammals more than 80 million years ago, and recent genetic sequencing revealed that Kalugos are the closest living relatives to primates, the group that includes great apes and humans. Sometimes called flying lemurs, Kalugos are not actually closely related to lemurs, even if they share a slight resemblance. They can glide remarkably long distances, up to 200 feet from tree to tree, due to the fact that the mammal is basically just a big flap of skin. Its fur-covered membrane stretches from its face to the tips of its tail and claws. According to scientists, the patagium creates the greatest surface area possible between the Kalugo's limbs without the mammal ever having evolved an entire wing as bats did and capturing one this size is practically unheard of. So what do you think? Leave a comment, hashtag sweet topic. Our ancient relatives. A lot of heated discussion has gone over the years regarding the origins of humankind. Like, did we really start out as fish or primates? Or did our ancient ancestors really start life out in Africa and spread out from there? Well, that answer is a solid maybe. While we still don't have definite proof for now, we do definitely know that the first fossil hominina were in fact discovered in South Africa back in 2013. The expedition was led by Lee Berger and the find took place in the Dinaledi chamber of the Rising Star cave system. It was there that they found over 1,500 specimens covering at least 15 Homo noledi individuals. By 2017, they collected fossils were dating back between 236,000 to 335,000 years old. But who were the Homo naledi? Well, like the other Homo species, including us humans in the Homo sapiens category, the naledi do resemble ancient humans, but their relationship still hadn't been defined. The term naledi means star in the southern Bantu language and refers to the location they were found in, the Rising Star Cave. Not much else was found along with their remains, though, so their diet and the types of tools or techniques they once used are all still a mystery. Their teeth could reveal what kind of food they ate, but they're so fundamentally different from any other Homo species that the results have still yet to be figured out. This had led to the theory that their environments were completely separate from one another, meaning the Homo naledi could be unrelated to all Homo species despite their physical outward similarities, 
Hopefully, a new find is still in the future that will answer the many questions of who exactly they were. Valley of the Kings To rest among the greats was a dream for rulers all over the world, but only a select few can truly claim to lie in the Valley of Kings. In the hills west of Luxor, hidden away among the barren lands are the Egyptian pharaohs of the Old Kingdom. Massive monuments were common for most Egyptian pharaohs, but what separated each line of royalty from the next were the treasures left along with their tombs. The Valley of the Kings has arguably the most famous of collections from these elaborate resting places. It was a famous royal burial ground during Egypt's New Kingdom from 1539 to 1075 BC. Some of the more noteworthy names in the tombs belonged to King Tut, Ramses II, and Seti I. Their resting grounds were a sign of preparation for the next world, an afterlife where the pharaohs were expected to join the gods and bring all of their valuables with them. The mummification process was also a part of that system and used as a means of preserving the bodies so the user's soul could reanimate in the spirit world. But does that mean for every person not mummified, they wouldn't be able to move on like the pharaohs? Was there a different kind of system based on what happened to one's body after their passing? Kind of makes you wonder how other cultures' grave burying affected the public's quality of afterlife. As for the decorations of the Valley of Kings, it was completely glammed up. Golden masks, furniture and jewelry were found all over, but surprisingly, so was a lot of food and alcohol. Apparently, post-life feasting is a pretty big deal. A new discovery of the past. The oldest evidence of our human ancestors existing was found in Oduvai Gorge, all the way out in Tanzania. The extent of human history is still mostly a mystery, but a group of paleoanthropologists managed to find hundreds of fossils and stone tools that have been dated up to several million years ago, giving us the clearest view of our human past yet. The Oduvai Gorge is hidden between the Ngorongoro Crater and the Serengeti National Park over in the Great Rift Valley. Interestingly enough, the gorge itself isn't as old as the fossils it was holding. It came into existence around 30,000 years ago and after aggressive land shifting and river streams. Although the area is a mass of 30 miles long and nearly 300 feet deep, it isn't quite big enough to be labeled a canyon. Based on one of the original Greek scripts, specifically the story of Periplus of the Erythrean Sea, there's a section that describes the trade routes from the Red Sea in Egypt to the East African coast. From there, they visited Rapta, a settlement that would have been established in what's now modern-day Tanzania. Arabic documents from the 8th century are a bit more specific, giving details for the trade sites of Kilwa in southern Tanzania, as well as Lamu in northern Kenya. And then, skipping ahead some centuries to 1986, was when a team of American archaeologists joined forces with the Tanzanian research team to uncover more than 300 bones and teeth that are allegedly 1.8 million years old. Who knows what other kind of past we'll eventually be able to see in the future. Kingdom of Kush The Kingdom of Kush might sound like a good time to some people, but it's actually an important part of an amazing set of archaeological sites on the island of Moreau. The area was a major leading power back in the 8th century BC all the way to the 4th century AD and was found in the semi-desert landscape between the Atbara River and the Nile. The highlights of the sites are the royal city and the Kushite kings. At one point in time, it was known as the seat of rulers who oversaw Egypt for nearly a century. During this period, it had prominent vestiges, temples, pyramids, and even some domestic buildings for people to occupy. At its peak of civilization, the kingdom extended from the Mediterranean all the way to the heart of Africa, thriving with vibrant art, architecture, religion, and even languages from each region. The three major components of the area were its capital of Moreau and the two settlements and religious centers. Among these three sites were the best preserved relics from the Kingdom of Kush, which were mostly impressive architecture. The temples and palaces shaped the culture, specifically all forms of politics, religion, artistic and technological influences that reigned for over a thousand years. Just looking at the ceramics and ironworks will show you how much wealth and power the people wielded during a time before much prosperity. Even their water reservoirs were pretty luxurious for being so close to the desert, and it really helped keep them as a major powerhouse for the territory. Las Gil Paintings In 2002, a French team led by Xavier Guthers was studying the early stage of pastoralism in the Horn of Africa. 
During their expedition, they managed to find a site they hadn't expected, Las Gil, and it turned out to be one of the most important rock sites in the entire region. It exists in Somaliland of the northwestern part of the Horn of Africa. It settled on a granite outcrop sticking out from a plateau nearly a thousand meters above sea level. The unique name, Las Gil, means the camel's well in Somali and mostly relates to the two seasonal rivers surrounding the land. On the actual archaeological site, Xavier Guthrie's team found paintings and tools scattered around, along with tombs and rock shelters. The paintings are a bit rustic, showing what looks to be cows with curved white horns and masked udders. They used up a few different colors, including red, purple, yellow, brown, white, and black, as well as any combination of that group. But what stands out the most from these old cow paintings are that their necks have a rectangular shape that's either blank or filled with white and red stripes. While it could be an unusual and extinct animal that they meant to depict, what's more likely is that the cows at the time were given ceremonial ornaments to wear. It's a bit hard to figure out out from just these simple wall paintings, but the cows are often set in groups of up to 15 and are usually accompanied by human figures. So what does all that mean? If anything, art has really come a long way since the ancient past, advanced mazes. While mazes make a nice pastime on paper, they're a bit harder to come by in real life. But in the South Africa province is a series of structures that's interestingly built like a giant maze. Within the maze is a set of remote slopes and pastures, as well as the more notable Bakoni ruins. The area is described in English as the place of happiness. Maybe it's just because of how remote the land is, but it does seem to have a bit of pretty peace. The circular stone walls at least don't appear to be causing any unusual disturbances. The Bakoni ruins, as you might have guessed, were believed to have been built by the Bakoni people sometime during the 16th century. But despite their time frame, some historians seem to think that the culture is even older, possibly from the time of the mitochondria Eve, which is believed to have been the first modern human ancestor. But it's still too hard to say for sure, so we're just going to stick to the facts. And one fact is that the Bakoni people used to manage this landscape for their agriculture, a staple of their livelihoods at the time. Their techniques were considered especially advanced for that time, such as crop rotations and livestock management that enhanced their agricultural bounties. But did the stone mazes contribute to their special sciences? Some have thought so, while others think the walls might actually be just a few centuries old. It's all a bit mysterious, but there are still plenty of secrets left to solve. Kenya's Research Project Kenya is a major part of Africa that's pretty well known throughout the world, and considering just how massive the continent is, that's a pretty impressive achievement to stand out among the other countries surrounding it. But what's kept Kenya so prevalent after all these years is probably the rich history it's had, as well as the discoveries that are still ongoing. The Kubi Fora Research Project has paved the way for many of these discoveries, including both fieldwork and scientific research to learn more about the evolution of human life. The research project has dug up over 10,000 hominid fossils to date, with one of them being the Turkana boy, the earliest and most complete human skeleton ever uncovered. The find was located in the Turkana Basin, a 27,000-mile region that includes the saltiest lake in East Africa, Lake Turkana. That same lake is also known as the Jade Sea because of its mesmerizing color. But beware, it's a major landing spot for all types of migrating waterfowl, as well as a breeding spot for crocodiles, hippos, and plenty of venomous snakes. Probably not a great picnic area, despite the beauty of it all. The Turkana Basin, however, is much more famous for its fossil deposits. The first known expedition was back in 1902 from French explorers that found some vertebrate fossils. During World War II, the Allied troops that landed in Ethiopia also made their way out here to collect fossils from the lake in nearby hills. By 1968, enough fossils were found to really get things going. So the Kubi Fora Research Project officially began visiting Tia. Archaeological digs and historical land sites are not usually tourist-friendly. While some will often have rich history to explore, most are still in the middle of being excavated or maybe they're just too ancient for anything exciting to see, unless you're into really old clay and rocks. Tia is a town in the central area of Ethiopia, 
that might not be as fun to explore as Cape Town or Disney World, but it's known for a stunning burial complex just outside of the village. Some have compared the site to a smaller African version of the famous Stonehenge because of its 36 or so standing stones. Most of them are marked with special engravings, which archaeologists have said is a great reminder of the early Ethiopian culture. While these stones have yet to be fully analyzed, their age and purpose are still up for debate. It's been recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site as recently as the 1980s. The site itself is also thought to be fairly recent, maybe sometime around the 11th to the 13th centuries AD. But the megalithic stones are considered to be an ancient tradition before the first century. So these ones have either been inspired by the past culture, or maybe they're even older than we thought. One stone statue was discovered to have a sword symbol carved into it, which was not likely an ancient depiction, but also doesn't confirm that it was marked at the same time as the stone's placement. What does seem likely, though, is that this national monument could have been a slow and steady work in progress. The only thing left to do is to find someone to add on to it. Ancient Art Exhibit If you're really into ancient rock paintings, then do we have a spot for you. It's just outside the desert oasis of Jana in Algeria, but it might be hard to ask for directions if you can't pronounce the name. We'll give it a try anyway, but it might be easier just to write it down on your favorite map app. Tasil in Ajar is a national park with an alien type of landscape that looks like an open-air art exhibit. It even kind of reminds us of some old Star Trek desert planets. The sandstone rocks were used to their full extent as makeshift canvases and have somewhere in the ballpark range of 15,000 prehistoric drawings and engravements. Like most ancient art, the drawings on the walls have given us a vague glimpse at the past from animal migrations to daily human life. The pictures have been dated to around the Neolithic period when there was much more life in the environment, including wild antelopes, giraffes, and crocodiles. We know this because there are so many drawings of them all. But what's even more fascinating is just how many snapshots of daily life you could stumble upon just by walking around the art. Pictures of people dancing, hunting, and farming are common themes of the gallery, letting us know the type of fulfillment the past civilization once had. In addition to the art, the rocks themselves are a sight to behold. While most caves and caverns have been shaped by water and wind, these old stones can thank the winds and sands. Just like the pictures, the sand sculptures are a work of abstract art all of their own. Just don't get too absorbed in the art or you might get surrounded by the nearby wildlife. Tools older than time While the future might sound cool, lots of people seem to be really into uncovering the past. In western Kenya, there's a site where a significant, if outdated, set of tools were discovered to possibly be the oldest devices ever made. The stone tools are said to have come from over 2.9 million years ago, giving us even greater insight into just how ancient people really were. Of course, just because they're tools doesn't actually mean they belong to humans, at least of the Homo sapiens variety. What we can say with some confidence, though, is that they were likely used as a way to butcher hippos and mince up both plants and fruit. There were also some giant fossil teeth found at the site, which some experts have said likely belong to an extinct human cousin called the Paranthropus. Before these discoveries were made, most scientists just thought that Aldewan tools were the only invention of early Homo sapien ancestors, but that theory has been jumbled around a bit. Despite the existence of these prehistoric tools, there weren't any human fossils found at the excavation site, but the tools were definitely pretty cool. There were over 330 of them, with some being explained as strong enough to crush an elephant's molar better than a lion's canine. Why would anyone want to do this? Beats us, but it seems like a noteworthy achievement. Mummy Discovery The Egyptian city of Luxor was a well-established place for many significant events and landmarks. With that being said, it's no wonder so many discoveries have also been found at the mega metropolis. The most significant find, though, seems to be the several colorful sarcophagi and a thousand or so funerary statues in a 3,500-year-old tomb. The tomb belongs to the 18th dynasty and had at least eight mummies that were all discovered near the Valley of the Kings. The owner of the tomb was a city judge named Ursahat around 3,000 years ago. Because of a spike in tomb ratings at the time, Uzerhat took it upon himself to protect the important relics and deceased. Ushapti are a type of small curved figures.
that usually go along with brightly colored coffins, and over a thousand of them were found on display within the tomb. They were considered as a way to help the fallen Egyptians with the afterlife responsibilities, which means that the place must have been pretty important. While the original discovery was for 10 sarcophagi, only six mummies were found, but then an additional two were uncovered, bringing the total to eight. So what happened to the last two? Research is ongoing, but it's not like they just walked out on their own. That being said, the coffins and possessions were all well-preserved and finely decorated. White, orange, and green spots were found throughout the tomb, as well as on patterned pots. It all really adds up to the mystique of it all. But sooner or later, the answers might finally come our way. Cradle Caves the Cradle of Humankind is the home of the largest collection of human ancestral remains ever found in the world, and another example justifying that human life began in this section of the world. It was declared a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 1999 and contains an intricately complex system of limestone caves. They're called the Sterkfontein Caves of South Africa and are thought to have been discovered in the late 1800s. In 1895, a geologist named Dr. Draper reported fossilized bones in the caverns, but it took years before anyone figured out that early humans actually settled down in these dwellings. The Cradle of Humankind is a major source of fossil heritage and received its title after a series of unrelated events led to the eventual groundbreaking discovery. Dolomite was the real treasure that was found in large quantities of the Cradle and is considered to be a miracle mineral. In fact, without the Dolomite, there's no Cradle. It was around the 19th century that mining and agriculture became a dominant feature in South Africa's economy, which led to more settlers settling down and forcing increased farmland to support everyone. Mining at the cradle picked up the pace as demand for the lime and limestone increased to use as cement and construction. The agriculture also benefited as the lime could counteract soil acidity and even help out with the livestock feed to boost their calcium intake. But as minerals became more popular, more exploration was needed, and soon the scientific discoveries took over. To date, over 30 fossil-rich sites were uncovered, and around 500 cave sites have also been found so far. There's possibly even more still left to uncover, but for now, the researchers seem to have their hands pretty full. Back to the old drawing board. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, but how many words would you think the world's oldest drawing could be worth? If you're looking for the answer, you'll have to check out Blombo's Cave in South Africa. The cave is famous for our current understanding of early symbolism in modern humans because of the ancient drawings, engravings, and artistic crafts. The Blombos Cave is settled in the Blombos Private Nature Reserve just off the southern Cape Coast and is about 40 meters squared, or roughly 430 square feet. But despite the ancient history attached to it, the first known excavation didn't occur until 1991. Supposedly, modern humans visited the cave quite a bit back in the ancient days, around 70 to 100,000 years ago. But that was all before a mighty sand dune struck and sealed off most of the cave's entrance. Two pieces of ochre, a type of earthy pigment, were found above the sand dune, marking it as one of the earliest forms of communication between ancient humans of the time. Further into the caves were even more ochre pieces, proving that this level of communication wasn't a fluke, but a common way for these people to work together. The red lines also meant that this style of painting from 73,000 years ago was practiced well before anything else we've found before it. At least until an old ochre workshop with ancient toolkits were discovered deeper in the cave in 2008. The toolkits included two abalone shells that might have been used as a painting tool that existed up to 100,000 years ago. Guess it goes to show that art is pretty timeless. Sculpting the Past one of the earliest known societies of West Africa is the culture of Nak. They were a specialized group that settled in modern-day Nigeria from 500 BC to around 200 AD. They're known as the Nak culture because of the artifacts left behind by them were found near the town of Nak. Pretty self-explanatory, really. What they were also known for, though, is the unique terracotta sculptures that they crafted along with their early iron works. The discovery of the Nock artifacts were first made in 1943, when the now famous sculptures were determined to be of an unknown origin. It's not every day that you walk onto something no one else has seen for a few millennia. The sculptures were mostly modeled after human bodies and heads, but there were some animals thrown in the mix as well. 
humans were often depicted as sitting down rather than most sculptures where people usually stand up. So that's pretty interesting. After modern scientists analyzed the statues, they learned that most of the clay in each one likely came from the same single source. This could either mean that they had a limited supply or more likely that the materials were governed by a central authority that chose who got to use what and when and maybe even where. But even if they came from just one source, the Knox sculpture were found all over the region, across 78,000 square kilometers or a bit over 30,000 square miles. We're talking about either a really large civilization or a place where people didn't mind walking for their artistic expression. Throw in some advanced iron working techniques and you've got another civilization with more questions than answers, just like in the movies. Hey, we've seen this place before. You might have too. If you've ever watched Game of Thrones, Gladiator, or several other famous works of entertainment, this is the historic Kasbah, a type of fortified village called Ait Ben Hadu. It's a traditional pre hasarin land found in the Atlas Mountains that was first built in the 11th century and later rebuilt again in the 17th century. Despite feeling like an ancient kingdom, there are still some modern amenities you can take advantage of if you ever feel the need to check out this neck of the African neighborhood. The earthen buildings surrounded by the high-rising clay walls protect a few shops, cafes, and even some museums. In a sense, it almost looks like you're walking on to a fantasy set on a film, or maybe more like a documentary of a sand kingdom. In that sense, it's become more of a tourist attraction rather than an actual historical preservation, but it's been recognized and protected as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Of course, if you do decide to visit, just keep in mind that the ancient buildings aren't as ancient as they want you to think. There was a big gap between the 11th and 17th centuries, but that's still pretty old if you need to satisfy your history quota. Rise and Fall of Volubus People often visit Morocco for the fine dining and impressive landscapes, but the real treasure might just be the gift of historical architecture. Volubus isn't a fancy restaurant or a gorgeous beach, but it's one of the most well-preserved set of Roman ruins found between two imperial cities, Fez and Meekness. It was built and settled in well before the first century AD, and it was considered to be the center of the main kingdom of the southwestern region of the Roman Empire. The city continued to grow well into the third century AD, which is when most of the buildings you can find today were first built. The wealth of the town mostly came from olive production, which was a big hit in most of Rome and still pretty prevalent today. But the real draw of the time was their stunning mosaic tiles, parliament buildings, and the triumphant arches. Unfortunately for the ancient culture, the good times had to end as religion moved in. The previous churches were destroyed in the 8th century to make way for Islam's arrival, but the city persisted even after the collapse of the Roman Empire. By the 18th century, a major earthquake struck and destroyed a good amount of the older buildings, which led to a few French excavations to find what still remained. And by 1997, the leftover site became a UNESCO World Heritage Site, ensuring its preservation for years to come. The Kingdom of Aksum Present-day Ethiopia used to look a lot different back in the first century of the Common Era. Back then, it used to be called the Kingdom of Aksum and was celebrated with monuments of their ancient achievements. It's kind of hard to believe that the solid structure is over a couple of thousand years old, but the city was known for being pretty wealthy especially as far as most African civilizations go. It held the balance for a lot of trade routes connecting the Roman Empire to the Middle East and India, giving the kingdom a good amount of bargaining power for the best deals and prices. The capital city peaked at a high of 20,000 residents who contributed to the advanced monuments and written scripts that survived the test of time. But on the other hand, the city was also known for introducing Christianity to the other side of Sub-Saharan Africa, so there really was a lot going on for them. The locals were a passionate group that took full advantage of their resources. Gold and ivory made its way in and out of the city, leaving behind traces of wealth as they moved along to other regions. But with these rich exports came a lot of other trades that wouldn't be on our radar today. Their claim to fame had to deal with rhino horns, tortoise shells, and even human beings back when the slave trade was still gaining traction. Not every advanced culture was benevolent, but the price of wealth usually comes pretty steep. Old vs. New In Botswana is a town called Palepi, and just 20 kilometers away is where you'll find Old Palepi. What's the difference? 
Aside from the people currently living in Palapi, Old Palapi is more of a monument site that holds a strong sense of history from the Stone Age to the medieval era. It was first put on the map when the capital was rediscovered in 1889. The remains of the distant past were established by the ruler of the time, Kama III. He intended to make the city a new capital until he realized the shortage of water they'd soon be facing. Couple that with the fact that trade wasn't easily accessible and suddenly the site was downgraded to an afterthought. Interestingly enough, after the old town was intended for greatness, it just sort of shrank as the years went by. Plus, just in case you're wondering, regular Palapi is much more popular than the old version. Port Town Rebirth Port towns are the backbone to a lot of well-established trade centers. It's easier to get more imports when you have people constantly coming in and out of your town. Kilwa Kisawani was one of the biggest port towns in Swahili, but only lasted from the 12th to the 14th centuries in the Common Era. At the peak of their civilization, the town was the largest settlement on the coast of East Africa and carried the Indian Ocean trade network on its back. Unfortunately, most of the city's relics were destroyed over the centuries from all of the ocean tidal waves repeatedly striking them. Turns out, Mother Nature isn't too fond of fine art. Combined with the locals' repeated use of coral stones, UNESCO eventually had to step in and do their best to preserve the amount of history still remaining so that the city could rebuild itself. Thankfully, the area managed to recover a good amount and by 2013, it was removed from the list of World Heritage Danger. Now, if they can only keep the ocean calm, they can start rebuilding some of their monuments again. So, what's in store next for African archaeologists? We're going to go ahead and guess more bones are in the future. Or should we say, in the past? Either way, there's a lot of human history and even more questions. So we'll just keep on digging as long as you keep watching.